Hello, Blake Grizz here with F64 Academy and F64 Elite. And recently I've received a bunch of requests on exposure blending. And it's a topic that really I don't do a whole lot with. But a couple of people have asked, hey, how would I use exposure blending with your blend diff techniques or with some of the panels that you have? And quite honestly, it's very difficult for me to answer that question because I don't do a whole lot of exposure blending because of years ago, I tried it and I didn't like it. But I don't feel like that's a very good answer, so I reached out to an exposure blending guru and asked him if he could help me with some exposure blending techniques, and he's going to do that right here on F64 Academy. Hey, Sean, can, can you hear me? Can you see me? Oh, uh, hang on, Blake. Yeah, I can see you. And I can hear you. Can you see me? I can hear you, but you know how these things are. They're all they're all different. Uh, yeah, Skype, okay. Zoom, they're all, they're all different. Let me fire up. Oh, there's my video. Okay. Let's see. Hey. Ah, sweet. There you are. How's it going, man? Uh, it's going good. How are you doing? Good to see you. Good. Yeah, good to see you too. Um, so in like the last three weeks, I've had several requests for exposure blending. And here we talked in Out of Oregon quite a bit about what our specialties were. And in the car, as we were, you know, driving, and I heard a lot about all the various things that you know, and you sound like a guru at this exposure blending stuff. Whereas, you know, I tend to go the easy route. So um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this exposure blending stuff. And you know, I got an image that I'm working on that I think could really use it, and uh, I'd like to see what you got on it. Yeah, sure. Yeah, glad to show you. And it's great timing because I actually have a question for you about color theory. So. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, maybe uh, I'll answer your question and um, you can put that on your channel and um, you can answer my question and I'll put that on my, uh, my channel and we'll get both our questions answered. Perfect. And then everyone learns in the process. This is awesome. Let's do it. I like it. Let's do it. Okay. <laughs> cool. So yeah, exposure blending. Um, you know, it's something actually that is, I, I think it's still really important and useful. It's becoming less important uh, as camera dynamic range you know, improves and it continues to improve. Uh, it used to be that if you had very much uh, contrast range in the light at all, uh, you were outside the dynamic range capabilities of your camera, you know, back in, back when I started shooting digital, like on a, a Canon 10D or something, mm -hmm. um, didn't take much before I couldn't maintain all the highlights and the shadows in one exposure. So exposure blending was the only way to deal with, or bracketing exposures and then blending them somehow, however you did it, was the only way to deal with those kind of high dynamic range situations. Today's cameras can capture so much more dynamic range is that a lot of those situations that used to kill us in the past, you can get it all in one exposure now. Um, you know, most cameras you did, you expose for the highlights, then you can recover the shadow part later on and you're fine. Uh, but there still are situations in the world where the dynamic range of the light is just too great, even for today's cameras. So in those situations, if you want to be able to see all the, the colors and details from the brightest uh, highlight all the way down to the deepest shadows, bracketing exposures is a good way to go. And then I like to blend exposures in Photoshop using uh, layer masks and masking techniques because for me, I feel like that's how I get the best information that my camera recorded. You know, all the places that were properly exposed for the highlights, I use those pixels. And all the places that were properly exposed in a different exposure for the shadows, I use those pixels. And so I'm not, you know, having some algorithm kind of mushing all my pixels together to create some HDR file that's not my original pixels anymore. Right. Yeah. I used to, I used to have a website called everydayhdr.com. Ah, back in the HDR days. Yep. And then I had to rebrand because cameras got better. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Rebrand or bust. <laughs> uh, yeah. Right. There you go. Well, this is a technique that, like I said, I don't use it. I probably use it on less than 10% of my images, but when I need it, it's really nice, nice to have. So let me, let me just jump over here. Uh, to share my screen. So this happened to me in Oregon, actually. You know, it was a sunset, and there was this beautiful light in the background. Foreground was really dark because it's at that time where the sun is right there cresting. And that's the kind of dynamic range that even now the Sony A7 5 million can't even, <laughs> can't even get that kind of dynamic range because it's above 15 stops of light. You know, there's just too much going on. So I think this, this is really where I'm going to use it when I run into those situations. Exactly. Yeah. And they do crop up and, you know, shooting right into that bright, you know, a bright light source, usually the sun is something that can create really dramatic imagery. You know, you get backlighting, rim lighting, you get really deep shadows. 
that's you know looking right into a sunset or a sunrise is where you get those really great sky colors so we want to do it sometimes um so this is a way that you can kind of have your cake and eat it too you know so um so let's just start so i've got a couple examples here i can i can work with you on um the first one's a, a simple one just to give the basic concept and then we'll go to a little more kind of comp uh, more advanced version of it so here i have two exposures this is a scenario where um you know shooting again this is a sunset shooting right towards where the sun was it was behind these clouds but uh but it was still too much dynamic range for the camera at that time when i had my sky properly exposed then my foreground was all blocked up and to recover that much shadow detail would be really noisy and not just not good quality there. When I expose for my foreground, then of course now I'm overexposing the sky. So two separate exposures. I wanna bring the best of the pixels of both of these exposures together into one image. So I'm just gonna come in and edit in Photoshop and I'm gonna edit these in Photoshop just as layers. So it opens them as layers in a single uh, image document here. And for this easy technique, I'm doing it this way. When we do the more complex one, I'll use a slightly different method, but uh, we'll just show you this with this. Uh, let's move us down here so I can see us. All right, so here we go. We've got our two layers and it opened them with the lighter layer on the top, the darker one on the bottom. It really doesn't matter. Um, you can go either, you can go with this from either direction, but for me, how I usually do it is I usually have my dark layer on top. So I'm just gonna move that to the top right now. Um, that makes sense to me. And so I've got my dark layer on top. I've got my light layer on the bottom. I want to use the pixels from up here in, uh, from the dark exposure and the pixels from down in the foreground from that lighter exposure. Now, one of the things you need to make sure is that your two exposures align properly. And as long as you set up on a tripod and the tripod didn't move, then they should align just right out of the camera. But if they don't align, um, you can select them both in Photoshop and go to uh, edit, um, oh, uh, ah, right here, auto align layers. That's one way to get them to line up and let Photoshop auto align them. But sometimes if you've got things that are moving between the two frames, like the clouds moved or a wave moved, it'll try to line up the things that moved and then it'll get your actual static landscape out of alignment and that doesn't always work. So you can also just lower the opacity of that top. You gotta make sure you have one selected, 50%. Yeah. I think you do it with the difference blend mode, which mm -hmm. also works well. Anyway, and then with the move tool, then you can just use the arrow keys to nudge your two layers into alignment that way. So once you get your images aligned, you just wanna make sure they're aligned, then you're just gonna add a white mask um, to that layer and on a mask white reveals that layer and black shows through to the layer that's underneath and so for something that's really simple like this it's just an ocean uh, horizon and it's kind of misty out there so there's no really defined transition point between those two exposures or where the the light and the dark is so you can just use a gradient on this uh, which is really simple so here's the gradient tool and I'm just gonna drag a gradient on that mask across there and let that do my blending. And I can draw different gradients until I get that transition from one exposure to the next where I want it so that I think it looks uh, the most natural and maybe somewhere in there. So that's a really simple, I mean, that's like the easiest, quickest blend you could do. And you could still work with this mask if you wanted to pick a, uh, a white paintbrush or excuse me, a black paintbrush at maybe like a 30% opacity if I wanna bring through, uh, that's too much, just bring it down to like 10%. Just bring through a little bit of the lighter exposure in some of those areas. Yeah, a little exposure blend there. I've brought together those two exposures so that I've got a properly exposed image all the way through. Now that's about the most simple version of exposure blending that you're gonna get. Um, but that's the basic concepts. It's you've got a light exposure and a dark exposure. Uh, a, a layer mask and you use the layer mask to decide which pixels from the dark exposure you're going to show and which pixels from the lighter exposure you're going to show. So that's the basic idea. I think I tried to overcomplicate it. You made that look really simple. Oh, well, this is a simple <laughs> example. I started with a simple one, but let's, uh, let's go to that more complex example here. Well, what I like about that too, is that it gives you more control. Cause if you use an HDR, program or if you use Lightroom or Adobe Camera Raw to say merge the HDR, you don't know what it's doing. Exactly. 
So there you get more control. And it's largely global. You know, there I could totally decide which pixels I was keeping from which exposure and where. Whereas when you do an HDR blend, it's blending the whole image. So, you know, um, you, you can't pick and choose and decide how much of the effect you want where. Right, because you couldn't say, hey, give me 30% of that sky. It's going to say, hey, well, I gave you what I gave you. You're going to eat it if you like it or not. It's up to you. <laughs> exactly, yeah. All right, so now let's go to this, uh, this example here. It's a similar to Seascape, but it's a little more tricky because I've got a, uh, you know, a more defined skyline here. Um, and let me just go to the, I've got a more defined skyline going along part of this. So part of this transition from light to dark is a hard edge. But then up here, the clouds are kind of obscuring um, the, uh, the transition zone. It's, it's kind of more of a smooth transition, you know, where that cloud is, there's no exact edge that I could make a selection along or try to paint along or anything like that. And then also down here in the water, I've got, you know, bright areas and dark areas of water and there, there's no real defined boundary. So I've got some areas of hard edge, some areas of more soft edge and some areas that are just kind of all over the place. That would be really hard to do a blend using that technique I used on the last one. So let's look at what we could do instead. So for this one, I'm gonna open up both of these and these are raw files that I haven't made any adjustments to. Uh, if I go to the develop module here, we can see that these are just raw straight out of the camera. I haven't made any adjustments um, to either of these. Now I'm just gonna open them both uh, but this time I'm not gonna open them as layers in a single document. I'm gonna edit in Photoshop, but I'm gonna open them as smart objects in Photoshop. And when you open images as smart objects out of Photoshop, oh, and this is, a, this is actually a bug in Lightroom and Photoshop is, which one would open there? Sometimes what it does is when you edit in smart objects and you've got two selected, it only opens one. So I have to try to open the other one now so you can get them both open here. Did we get them both? Oh, now it opened both of them. Yeah, so the first time it only opened one, <laughs> second time it opened two. All right, so now, now we've got the light one here and the dark one here, which is great. Um, but the problem is we need them both in a single image document. And we can see that they're smart objects by the little uh, icon here in the, the corner. And when you open images as smart objects out of Camera Raw or out of Lightroom, those are what are called linked smart objects. They're actually linked back to the original raw file. So different than if I had opened them not as smart objects, if I'd opened them as a regular image file, like a TIFF file, and then made them a smart object, if I double clicked on it, it wouldn't take me back to the original raw information. But if I double click on this, it does. It opens up camera raw, and now I've got my raw adjustment controls. And if I had made any um, pre-adjustments to my raw uh, image here or back in Lightroom, those adjustments would be showing up here right now. And anything I do to this will be saved, not back in Lightroom in the original raw file, but in this uh, smart object here in Photoshop. So anyway, that's the power of opening as smart objects is you have access back to that original raw information. So now I need to get these stacked together in an image document, uh, a single image document. And I can't just like copy and paste um, because then we rasterize the smart object and that's not what we want. We want to keep it as a smart object. So the way to do this is the one way, there's lots of ways, hold down the shift key with the move tool, hold down the shift key and click on one image and click and drag it up to the tab of the other. Or um, if you don't have these as tabs, you just have them open um, and kind of fit in the screen. If you see them both at the same time, you can just drag it on top of the other one. But if you've got them as tabs, up to the tab until you see the other image, then bring it down and release, and it'll lay that smart object, the dark smart object, right on top of the light smart object. And then I can just go ahead and close that other one. I don't need it anymore. Okay, so now that we've got those uh, stacked as layers, they're smart object layers. The next thing I'm going to do is use a luminosity mask to blend these with. And this might work with blend if also. I'd be interested to see if you can make this work with blend if. But um, with, um, with a luminosity mask, I'm able to use that for the transition zone so that it will perfectly feather both those sharp or hard edges as well as the areas that don't have real defined edges. Now, there's lots of ways to make luminosity masks. 
I know you and I both probably use custom panels for that, but if you don't have a panel to make luminosity masks for this, you actually only need a very basic luminosity mask, just a lights luminosity mask. But I'm gonna make it from the, um, from the uh, lighter layer. So I'm gonna turn off that dark layer so it's not visible. And I'm just gonna hold down control and click on the RGB channel in the channels panel here. And that'll load a lights luminosity mask. And then I'm gonna apply that mask, or sorry, that selection as a mask to that top layer. So I'm gonna turn that dark layer back on and then I'm going to just make a mask and that luminosity mask will be there. And we can see there it is. And already that's kind of helping with the blend. But the place where we want the blend to happen is just, like I said, in these transition zones. I don't want any of the real dark darks to blend. I want those to come from my completely from my lighter exposure. And I don't want any of the light lights to blend. I want those to come from my darker exposure. So the next thing I'm gonna do is grab the uh, paintbrush tool and I'm just gonna paint on that mask. And I'm gonna paint with black and I'm gonna go all the way to 100%. It's a very soft feathered brush. But I'm just gonna go full amount here and I can just paint down here and take out all of the, uh, the part of that mask down here where I only want to be seeing what's underneath. And then same token, I'm gonna to go to a white brush and up here in the sky, I'm just gonna paint all of the sky out up here 100% white. And if we see what that looks like, I'm now bringing in all of the, uh, the sky up there. So now what I have is this luminosity mask that's only helping with that transition zone, not with the sky, not with the foreground. It's just gonna work with blending the transition zone. Now we see the magic. Well, first of all, that's already a pretty good exposure blend, but it doesn't blend perfectly. Like up in the corners up here, uh, it's not quite a good tonal match yet. I think there's some other areas where the mountains look a little bright or the sky looks a little dark. So we wanna work with that. And this is where the smart objects come into play. So I'm gonna open up the uh, dark smart object first and go back to the raw settings. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna adjust this to imagine what if I was trying to get this image to look right from just that dark exposure only. Um, and what I'm gonna do is maintain those dark skies, but I'm gonna be opening up the exposure in the foreground here. It's gonna help match and blend in that transition zone. And even if it brings up more noise out of those shadow recoveries down here, we don't care because we're not gonna be seeing the image from that exposure down there because it's completely masked out. So hmm. open that up. And here's where I can open up my shadows and maybe bring up the blacks a bit, maybe bring up the overall exposure a bit and bring down the highlights to maintain the nice uh, colors and texture in that sky. But all I'm doing here is just getting that foreground to match closer to that lighter exposure back mm -hmm. in Photoshop. And this is just to help with the blend. Like I said, it doesn't matter what's happening down here and if I get noise down here, because it's only gonna be using some of these pixels in that transition zone. So we'll wait for it to update. And already it's blending a little more smoothly. And now I'm gonna open up the lighter exposure and do the same, except for I'm going the other way with it. I'm gonna try to recover these brights and make this area here more like it would be if I was trying to work just from a single exposure. So I'm gonna bring down the highlights and I may bring down the exposure. And we can see uh, this is why I can't do this from a single exposure because there's parts of that sky that are just not recoverable. Uh, but if I bring that down and I may bring the shadows, uh, see, up a little bit, or see. Yeah, I'm not sure which way. And the nice thing about the smart object is you can come back to this and do this over and over again. So if this doesn't quite get it, Okay, that's better, but I think it kind of darkened my foreground a little too much. So I can just open that up again. Let's see, let's bring up those shadows a little bit in the foreground. Um, yeah, a little bit more even. And this is that lighter exposure, so this foreground now is gonna be really clean. It also has the wave motion and this uh, ray of light coming through the center of these rocks. That's what I want from that exposure, and that's what that mask is giving me. So let's let that update. And there we go, okay. So now I've blended these two exposures 
I've got the best pixels from up here from the darker exposure, the best pixels down here from the lighter exposure. And if we zoom in and take a look at the transition, that luminosity mask, which looks like that, which is controlling that transition zone. You can see we don't have any halos, no obvious edges, no obvious place where I painted. And even up here where these clouds are misting across those mountains, it's just a really smooth, natural, perfect blend. So using a luminosity mask like that to control your, um, your transition zones, in combination with the uh, the smart objects, so that you can help those transition that that transition zone blend better between the two exposures, I find makes really good natural looking exposure blends. Wow, yep, I'm sold. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, and this is what I'm interested to see because I, you know, I'm using a luminosity mask to do that. Um, I'd be interested to see if this same principle would work with with a blend if uh, blending approach, but still with the uh, the smart objects to help the blend zone or that transfer uh, that transition zone. Yeah, I'm going to try that. I'm going to try both techniques. You know, the, the nice thing about a mask is that you can, you know, hand paint on them. A blend if it's more stringent in that uh, it adapts to what's ever underneath it, which is great. But at the same time, um, you can't really paint in where you want that blend if to be or not. So I'm going to see, I'm going to play with this because I think that there's something here on this one. But I in the past, I had tried exposure blending. This is probably back in like 2015. Um, you know, our techniques weren't quite there. Adobe Camera and Lightroom weren't quite there. Um, people were going away from HDR and going more towards exposure blending. I was still on the HDR train in 2015. Didn't want to jump off. Um, <laughs> it was moving too fast for me. <laughs> um, so, uh, but I tried exposure blending and I was never really sold because I couldn't get that transition to be right. But here, you know, I was I was either like a, it's an if this or that thing. But you're saying, well, no, why? Why it can be both? You know, right. we want this for this. We want this for this. And let's just use this little strip here as our as our blend. And that's that's awesome. Yep, exactly right. Yeah. So I find that that works. Ninety percent of the exposure blending situations I get into, that technique works really well. Uh, once you get good at it, it's fairly fast. And um, yeah, the results just look good. And like I said, that way you're working with those original pixels that your camera actually captured, not something that's been, you know, um, algorithm together by some software somewhere. Right, right. And, you know, that's what it's all about. You know, when we, you know, as you said, we both use different forms of panels um, to, to do this. And it's kind of funny because sometimes people will email and be like, well, Sean said to do it this way. And I'm like, well, that's cool. You know, and they're like, well, does it upset you that Sean did it this way? I'm like, no, should I be upset that Sean did it that way? I mean, like, we're all friends here, you know? We aren't in competition, you know? We had so much fun in Oregon that, um, you know, it. at first, though, when I first met you in Oregon, I was like, um, I don't know how to talk to this guy. <laughs> and I always just assume everybody's friendly and, and friends. So, you know, that's me walking around, which is probably, I'm probably... Um, stepping on toes and making people angry because it's like, who does he think he is? <laughs> That's awesome. Well, that was, that was a lot of fun. And yeah, I agree. Um, and the, the fun thing, about, I think one of the really fun things about Photoshop and about photography is, is that, you know, it's, it is, it's a creative artistic process. It's about how do you get to an image that you like, that speaks to you and maybe speaks to other people. And, there's so many different pathways you can take there and different tools and skills. And um, with that variety, we all get to choose what works for us and how we want to go about doing that. Right. Yeah. And, and you, you pointed out that that's awesome. And we're all going to do it differently regardless, which is actually kind of cool. It's that, you know, we're all going to learn something different from somebody else. And then what we get to do is then take all that we've learned from each other and turn into a technique that works for us by the way our brain works. And I think that's really cool. So I'm going to I'm going to try this here after we get off this phone. I'm going to try this and see what I come up with. And I'll let you know about that. Awesome. Well, good luck. I uh, Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm psyched to see what it uh, you know, how it works for you and what you do with it. Uh, just let me know if you run into any issues. I'd be glad to help you out with it. It's awesome to have a personal Sean Bagshaw there to help me out. Oh, it's awesome to have a personal uh, Blake Rudis from F64 Academy to help out with color. That's awesome. All right, cool. Well, I'm going to hang up because I'm inspired now. I'm going to go try this. And um, yeah, you'll see what I did in the conclusion of my video that I'm going to put up on YouTube. And, and you can see what 
I did with Blake's stuff than the video that I'm putting on my channel on YouTube. Wow, it's like... <laughs> it's like YouTube Inception. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man, great chatting with you. Good to chat with you too, Blake. Take care, man. All right, so it was awesome that Sean was able to hop on here and show us his exposure blending techniques. So what I've done is I've taken his idea of the exposure blending and I'm gonna break down and give you a couple of examples here. So what you see on the left-hand side, this is an HDR image from this series of brackets uh, in, from Adobe Camera Raw and Lightroom. And what I've done to all three of these is I've applied the same basic adjustments that I would normally do to my photographs. I haven't gone to an outlandish uh, post-processing. I wanted to keep this really simple. So this is an HDR process in Adobe Camera Raw and Lightroom that has then been color graded and also has some of my uh, blend if and zone system techniques on them. This is Sean's example of an exposure blend where he showed us that, that very beautiful transition between the areas that we want to transition within one another in those two exposures. And I love this technique. And then just as Sean was saying in the video, hey, I wonder how that would work with your blend if techniques. So what I did with this image was I took that same concept of the exposure blending that we had in Sean's video, but I combined it with some custom masking and I can just brush this out here too. This doesn't need to be here with some custom masking and the blend if. And we can see the blend if, if we turn on our color overlay here and we turn on that color overlay, this is the only area that's really being affected in the image. So that's basically where the blend if is being uh, added to this photograph. It's just barely happening in this seam here. But you can see that when we zoom in here, the mask itself is all white. But you can see how some things are poking through uh, the, the mask there. That's basically blend if being used as a luminosity mask uh, to help blend those two exposures together. And really, uh, between Sean's example here and this example here, they look almost identical. So as you can see here, does it really matter whether we use a luminosity mask or a blend if? Not necessarily. And it's not an if this, then that. It's not an if you're gonna use this panel or if you're gonna use this type of mask, you have to do this. You know, there's there's things can blur and they can, no pun intended, things can weave within one another so that you can create a really good exposure blend technique from either using luminosity masking, using blend if, or even if you wanna stick with the traditional HDR method and do HDR process, that's fine as well. For me, I'm really liking this, these exposure blending techniques that Sean Bagshaw showed us. And I think there's some real value in there, especially getting that nice little sliver of luminosity mask to just blend exactly what it is that you want to blend together. And the idea of using smart objects together with that is really cool. John's website is outdoorexposurephoto.com. Go there to see some awesome video tutorials from another educator that I respect very much. He's been doing this stuff for a lot longer than I have and is phenomenal in his trade of teaching. His photography is also great. Uh, he's got a great gallery there that you can peruse through. You can really tell that he's a craft in Photoshop to create the images that he creates. Also, if you would like to subscribe to Sean Bagshaw on YouTube, there is going to be a subscribe button at the end of this video to go to Sean's page and subscribe to his YouTube channel. And also underneath that will be a video that I did for him on color grading on his channel. So we did this kind of like video flip flop. It's a really cool concept. That way you get double the education in one day. Really cool. And we also have to send a big shout out over to Sean and thank him for uh, his generous offering of time to show us uh, his workflow process with exposure blending. It was really unique and I think it's something that we can all add to our toolbox. Thank you very much for taking the time to watch this. Head over to Sean's YouTube channel to check out my video on color grading.